Welcome to this video where I'm going to teach you every step it takes to create low poly characters like these. I'm going to install Blender 3.5, we'll model the character step by step, we'll colorize the character, we'll create accessories for the characters, model hair, and create the armature. And we're going to weight paint the character for the armature, create long clothing, we'll animate the idle animation and the walk cycle, and we'll make a female version of the character with long hair and then we'll do quick cloning and turn this character in minutes into as many characters as you want. We're going to finish off by importing the character into Unity and animating it and doing a Mixamo import as well. And I want to give a huge thank you to my patrons because without you, I couldn't make videos like these. And to say thank you, I'm giving the tutorial tier 10 of these characters and I'm giving the game dev tier 30 of the characters and the hero tier on my Patreon site, we'll get access to download and use a hundred of these characters and you can use them in any project you want. Prototypes, free games, paid games, commercial games, that's the same thing, royalty free, and I hope you make a really successful game with them. So head over to patreon.com slash infancia if you want to be a Patreon and support this channel, but now let's learn how to make them. Head over to blender.org and download the latest version of Blender, I'm using 3.5. Click to install Blender and it's going to be yours to keep forever because it's free. How cool is that? And I just accept the license and click next, 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 and uh, just default installation will do just fine. Then you can start up Blender and just accept the default and save the new settings and click on the side of the splash screen to get started. If you're super new to Blender, this is the viewport that we're mainly going to be working in and to the left here is a camera that we're going to delete. So I'm going to click to select it and then click delete button on the keyboard to delete it. And I'll do the same for this light up here to the right. To the top right is the outliner where the objects will be listed and below that we've got a properties panel that we'll be visiting. But we're going to go into the shading tab at the top and here we're going to click on the default cube and that's going to bring up the node editor where we can configure our material. I'll expand the viewport a little bit here on the edge. And then you can open up your browser and go to tinyurl.com slash Infensia palette. And here you can download a set of palette files that I've got. And it's just a bunch of PNG files. Click on the download link here and save it anywhere on your hard drive. Once it's downloaded, you can show that folder and then just extract the files by right clicking on them and go and extract all if you've got Windows or anything else that you can unzip them with. We're mainly going to be using these two, the Infensia palette, O2 Albedo and the emissions textures. Resize the Explorer window and see so you can see the Blender window too. And then you drag the Infancia Palette O2 Albedo.png into the node editor. And also do the same for the emissions texture. Just click, hold the left mouse button and drag it into the node editor. Now we're going to hook those up to the material. And the first one we're going to be dragging from the output of the Albedo texture onto the base color node. And then we'll drag from the emissions node onto the emissions input node of the material. I'm also going to change the strength of the emission to 20 and we're not actually going to be using the emission for this one but it's going to be here anyway because it's good for the future if you want stuff to glow like eyes on a cool character or something like that. And now we can go back to the modeling tab where we actually came from and normally here's where you'd model but I recommend that you go to this UV editing tab instead because the way we colorize this object is going to be really handy to be in this view instead. There's a drop down to the top left here that you can click and we can see the albedo texture here so we know what colors we have to play with. And now at the top right of the viewport we're going to change with this little drop down arrow here and we're going to select the texture button so we can actually see the texture that we're going to be colorizing the object with. If you click on this you'll see that the cube turned black in my case and it might not be the same for you. It's because the active texture node in the node editor is set to the emission texture. To fix this we need to go to the drop down in the top left corner and change to the shader editor and then just toggle between the two textures and make sure the last one that you select is the albedo texture that's plugged into the base color. And then we can toggle back to the, in this case I switched it to the image editor so we can see the image again. And now we can see the correct texture in the viewport that we're going to be modeling with. Use the middle mouse button to rotate the viewport and hold the shift key and the middle mouse button to pan the viewport. This is going to be extensively used when we're doing the modeling. Sometimes when you model, the polygons on your mesh will be facing the wrong way. And to make sure that we spot this, if it happens, we go back to the drop down in the top right viewport and then enable back face culling. When this is enabled, if a face is inverted, you'll be able to see through it. Otherwise, that might not get rendered in a game engine, for example. So you want to have backface culling enabled so you can spot those mistakes in that case. And now we're about to start modeling. When the object is selected, press tab on the keyboard to enter editing mode. And then at the top here, there are three little icons. The first one is vertex. 
the second one is edge, and the third one is face. And we're going to be toggling between these a lot. When you've got vertex selected, you can click on vertices and select them to edit them. When you've got edge select, you can click on edges to select and edit those. And if you've got face selected, then you can click on full entire faces and select and move those around. Use the keys 1, 2, 3 at the top of your keyboard to toggle between these modes, and you're going to be switching between these a lot, so you best learn the hotkeys. And in the top left we have to switch the view to UV Editor. I'd put it on Image before, and that's scaringly similar, but we have to be in the UV Editing tab here. And now when you select the face, it's represented in 2D on the left on the texture. And you can see if I select all the vertices here on the left and press G to move them, you can see that they update on the cube. So whatever is shown on the quad on the left there is actually represented in 3D space as well. Let's do another quad here as well. I'll click to select it and press G to move it around. That's the hotkey to move it. You'll be using that one a lot. And you can see how it updates on the cube. If I press A to select everything here, and on the left now, we're going to be using some more hotkeys. I'll click A on the left as well and select all the faces or all the vertices. I press S to scale it, and you can see how it's scaling up and down with the mouse. But then we hit zero on the keyboard, and that's magically going to shrink those UVs down to an infinitely small point. Now when I press G, I can move this little orange dot around, and whatever color I place it on is going to be the color that the mesh is showing. And this is going to be extremely useful, because when we model our characters, we can instantly change faces to have different colors, rather than having vertex colors or texture painting the whole thing. So you'll find out soon enough that this is going to be extremely useful to quickly colorize your low-poly character. Next, to speed up your modeling, use the numpad keys 1, 3, and 7 in particular to toggle between front, side, and top view. And not all the computers, especially laptops, have the keypads or numpads, and you can actually go up to Edit, Preferences, and then go to Input. And here you'll be able to toggle Emulate Numpad. And now the top keys on your keyboard will act as a numpad. The downside, of course, is that unfortunately you'll have to remap the keys for 1, 2, 3 to select Vertex, Edge, and Face Select. Or you could just plug in an external keyboard so you get the numpad. I'll switch off the emulation for now again, and then we're back to normal. And now it's important that we spend a little bit of time to talk about the coordinate system and the axis. And Blender uses Y, positive forward, and that's the green axis. And you want to make sure that your, your characters are facing in this direction when you're modeling them, so they end up correctly in the game engine. And Blender also uses uh, the X axis, or the red axis here, the horizontal one, and it's got the z-axis for up and down. And this is different from Unity, for example, that uses the z-axis as forward, so it's a bit confusing. But just make sure that you model your characters now facing forward, so their face is going to be aligned as is if they were looking down the green axis. Very important. So you have to twist your viewport with the middle mouse button to make sure that the character is facing along the green arrow. Very important. We're going to enable a couple of add-ons that come with Blender. So go to Edit, Preferences, and select Add-ons. In the Search field, type in Auto, and then select the add-on called Mesh Auto Mirror. Enable this one, and then in the Search field, type in Loop, and enable Mesh Loop Tools as well. Now you can close this down, the window, and we'll have a couple of add-ons that are going to be really handy for low-poly modeling. We have the Auto Mirror, and then if you're in Edit Mode with Tab, then you have some loop tool add-ons as well. And we're already going to use the auto mirror tool now, so when you have the object selected, under the edit tab, go to auto mirror and change the orientation to negative, and then click the auto mirror button. And you won't necessarily see anything right now because the object is mirrored, but since we're in object mode, you can't see it. So when we press tab to go into edit mode, you can see that there's a split through it, and on the right, under the properties panel, click on the little wrench icon, and we can see that it's applied the mirror modifier. When we are in mirror mode, I can only edit one side of the object. I can select on this side by clicking on a face, but if I try to select on the other side, it's not possible. I press 1 on the keyboard to go into vertex select, and if I select one of the vertices here in the middle, and I try to drag it past the center point, it's not going to be possible, and that's because we have clipping enabled on the mirror modifier. If I disable clipping and try, I can actually separate the vertex there, so you want to make sure most of the time to always have clipping enabled. That way, you're not going to get vertices that are poking through to the other side. You can enable clipping again, and also move the vertex back into its correct position, if that happens. And now we're going to start with the character. So we have pressed Tab to get into Edit Mode, and 1 we've selected to get into Vertex Select. 
With the mouse over the viewport, press A to select all the vertices, and if you double click A, you can deselect all of them. That's handy. So A to select all of the vertices. Then I'm going to press Control Numpad 1 to get the back orthographic view, and that's actually looking backwards, which means that we'll be looking at our character's face. That's facing forward. We can zoom in a little bit here with the mouse wheel, and now we're going to be putting this torso in place. So I press S to scale it down with the mouse. And when you're scaling, it can behave a little bit strange in auto mirror. So if we use the middle mouse button to pan around a little bit, we can see roughly how it's affected our torso when we scaled it down. I press Control numpad 1 again to get back to the back views, and I press G to move it up. You can see that the clipping in the auto mirror is taking effect here because we can't really slide it past the center point, which is good. I slide it up a little bit and I place it under the one meter mark. That's where we want our torso. We're going to make this character three head height, which is a pretty common cartoon feel. I like the that proportion for the characters. And then I press three to get into face select mode and I select the topmost face of our character. If I don't see this little gizmo to move it, I can press shift space bar and then either press G or select this move tool. You can also select it on the left there. And now we get this little handy axis tool to drag these faces along a perfect axis. If I go back to the control numpad one view to see our character from the front, I can start to slide up and down and now I'm going to press E to extrude and that's actually going to create some additional geometry for us to work with. And we're going to be using E a lot to extrude our faces, up, down, left, right. <laughs> and in this case, we're sliding up a little bit on the torso. I press 2 to get into edge select mode, and the bottom most edge that we have there uh, by the hip, I'm going to slide that in on the x-axis. And you should have a shape that looks pretty much like this if you're following along now. And then I press 3 to go into face select mode again, and I select the lower slanted face there. And I select it and I press E to extrude it, and then I drag it out a little bit and press S to scale it down. And this is going to be our top part of the leg, the upper leg, just below the hip. Now that we've got a low poly hip, let's go back to control numpad 1 to see the front of the character. And now we can start to move it in a little bit. We'll press G to move it in and then press R to rotate it. Use the mouse to just drag it to make it a little bit flatter again so we don't have that angle on it. Then I press E to extrude it down, press R to rotate a little bit so it goes flat again, G to move it to where the knees are, E to extrude the legs down again, and then E to extrude the foot. And now we're going to flatten the foot to the ground here as well, and there's a little trick we can do. We can press S to scale, press Z to lock it on the Z axis, and hit 0 and return. Let's do it again just to show it a little bit more exaggerated. S to scale, Z for Z axis, 0, and hit return, and that flattens it. Up on the item here, we can actually force this Z coordinate all the way down to zero, and that makes sure that the foot is perfectly flat against the ground. It's very important that the origin of the character is right between the feet, at zero, zero, zero in the scene. That makes it a lot easier to make the game. Now let's rotate the viewport and extrude a foot. Select the front face here, and then we can flatten that by scaling it on the Y axis and hitting zero, and then we press E to extrude it out, and here's our low poly foot. Another thing that's important here is that when we extruded the leg down, we stopped at the kneecap and pressed E to extrude again. And at least one line there is important, and we're going to increase that to two probably later on, because it's important to have some geometry when we deform the body. You can't just have like a long stilt there, that wouldn't really bend pr properly. So that's why we extruded it down, halfway down, and then extruded it again. Now we're going to extrude the torso, so select the top face and press E to extrude the torso up and then press E again to extrude a piece for the chest. Realize now that the torso part is about the same height as the legs and we're up to just about the one meter mark. Let's move it up a little bit more. Then we select the side face and extrude it out and press S to scale it down and this is going to be the beginning of our arm. Then from the front view of the character we press R to rotate it and get a little relaxed pose here. E to extrude it, and S to scale it down, and tweak it with R to rotate it to get a good angle out. And then E to extrude it from the elbow, along the axis to the side there, and then scale it and move it with G, and try to position it roughly where the hand would be. This could take some practice to get used to. Press E to extrude again, and S to scale it down to a wrist, and then E to extrude the wrist. Here we're going to extrude the hand now, and we're going to make a palm out of this, and that needs to be a little bit flatter, so I press E to extrude it just a tiny little bit. And when we've got a little bit of a distance there, press S to scale it and press Y to scale it on the Y axis. And then E to extrude it to where the thumb would begin. We're going to have a square thumb and then E to extrude it once more to get the palm of the hand. Then we're going to press where the thumb is going to be and press E to extrude that face. 
and now we have a very basic low poly palm. There are a few things to consider when you're making hands for your low poly character, and I tend to either choose one of three options. Either I go for a static hand, just a palm like this with a little curve on it, or sometimes I actually rig the hand as well to get it to deform so I can grip objects. In some extreme cases, if you want a super low poly character that's only going to be viewed for a distance, you can actually just have a little a square lump at the tip there. But now I press Ctrl R to introduce something called a loop cut, and use the mouse wheel to scroll up and down to choose how many loop cuts you want. Now we're going to introduce some extra geometry so we can curve the hand here, because we're going to go for a static curved hand. I select the top face here, and here's an interesting thing. We can actually, if we just try to rotate this front face now, you can see that it's only rotating the very first face. And we have something called proportional editing up here at the top, which is the O is the hotkey for this. And if I enable that, and then I press R to rotate, you can see that it affects the whole body now. And that's because I've got a massive radius on this proportional editing. <laughs> but if you use the mouse wheel to, to move it down, you can reduce the size that it affects. And now when we rotate it, we get a little bit of a better effect to just affect the little hand here. And I curve the tip and it's a little bit tricky still to get it right. So there are some different ways you can, you could either do it manually or use proportional, whatever works. But the important thing is that we're gonna curve this geometry now to get a little shape of a hand here. But again, if you're not comfortable with proportional, you could either do this manually instead. For example, if I, instead of rotate and I press Control Z to back it out a little bit, and then I move it down and then I rotate it, then it, I don't get that really strange unnatural curve. And this is, I'm gonna make this hand a bit like a Lego hand, if you imagine they're always ready to grip something. And I think this was pretty good. So I press two to get into edge select mode and I switch off the proportional editing. And then I tweak the handle a bit by just moving it on the axis tool here. If you don't see this little gizmo, remember it's shift space G or use the little tool on the left there with the arrows pointing in all directions to get this gizmo. And this way you can drag the uh, edges in this case along those forced axes so you don't go off into the distance. So we're going to get a little natural curve here and this is going to be a static hand. We're not going to be animating it. And then we're going to do the same for the thumb here. I'll move it in a little bit, press Control R to add a loop cut because we need a little bit of extra geometry if we're going to rotate it. Select the tip face, R to rotate it, and then put, press G to move it down a little bit. And then you can press Control Numpad Plus and that's a really handy way to expand and grow the selection. And likewise, if you press Control numpad minus, you can shrink the selection again. And that's gonna be very handy later on. And now we've got a bit of a natural curve that uh, is in between a fist and a palm. And I think most cases when you animate your characters, this look of a hand is gonna be pretty sufficient for most of the needs if it's not gonna move. And it's gonna save a lot of animation time if you can get away with having a static hand like this. Again, think of a Lego guy. It's always there ready to grip something that you want to put in it. And you don't really think too much about it if it's not moving the fingers properly. And especially if you're going to make a little platforming game or something, then you're not going to spot it so much. Now we're going to make the neck. Select the top of the character and the face there, and then E to extrude and S to scale it in. And here the scaling is a little bit off because we're near the center. So I have to move it in a little bit with G. Now we're going to make a massive big head here. So I E to extrude up the neck a little bit and then I press S to scale it out and we're going to go big. <laughs> and then I press E to extrude it a lot again and then go to the front view of the character and then I just move it up even more. And I want to make sure that the head is a cartoon head so it's about the same height as the entire torso or the entire legs. So it's a three head high character, a cartoon character. You can of course do it to your choice. If you want to have something smaller you can do that. But for this video I'm going for the cartoon characters, the low poly. If you think of a Mario character or something. Now we're going to shape the head, so I press Control R to introduce a loop cut about halfway or one third way up the face. And the way I shape my heads usually when I do the low poly count is uh, I move the bottom like jawline out a little bit like this along the Y axis to get a little, maybe a little bit strange face. But I also move all the, the bottom of the jaw out a little bit further as well and put it into place. And this is going to be where you tweak a little bit to find your particular style. But I'll show you how I've done it and I press Control R and then add another loop cut on the neck there and press S to scale that down a little bit because uh, it was doing too weird of a shape there. And then I press Control R again and here's the other feature that I usually feature on my characters. And I move out this so I get this little uh, extrusion at the, the lower jaw and then I move in where the eyes are going to be and put a little bit about a 45 degree angle there to get some cheekbones or something. And then you can slide up. Uh, usually I, I toggle a lot between edge mode or vertex select here. 
then I toggle between these modes and just try to start shape the head out. Press Ctrl R for another loop cut, and then I select the top face and press S to scale that down, and then G to move it a little bit. And here comes the first part where we're going to start to tweak a little bit. So I press 1 to get into Vertex Select. Select Vertex one by one, press G to slide them in any direction that you want, and use to rotate the viewport a lot here with the middle mouse button, so you can get it from different angles, because when you move a vertex, it's going to move it into the viewport's axis. So I usually tweak the viewport, and uh, with some practice, you start to get a feel for in what directions the vertices will move when you have it in this viewport. So tweak a little bit. It's a bit like a pigeon keeps repositioning its head to realize what's going on in the world. And likewise, you should use the middle mouse button, do little tweaks, rotate the viewports back and forth, and find how you can tweak the vertices here. So keep rotating to get the profile or the silhouette view, and then start moving all the vertices in around the neck. Toggle between edge select, face select, and vertex select here, and then just shape the head. And if you're following along, you could either look at this and try to replicate roughly. There's no specific unit distances or anything like that that we're going for. Just going to try to get the size of the head that's about the same size as the torso. And then uh, in this case, I, I want to resize it a little bit. So I select the top face and press Control plus on the numpad because I wanted to make it a little bit bigger to match that three head height. And then by growing the selection with Control plus on the numpad, you can go all the way down there and then press S to scale it and it'll uniformly scale the whole head up there. So I think this is a pretty good uh, shape. This is roughly what I tried to go for. And again, you can tweak this a little bit later on as well. You don't have to make sure that everything's perfect right now. Now we're going to repeat this process on the body too to get off this square look a little bit. And you'll notice now, if I press uh, to select these edges, you can hold the Shift key to select multiple edges like this. And often we do this, but there's a good way to do it as well. If you hold the Alt key, and click on one of the edges here, it'll actually loop select around this. So it'll save you a lot of time. And then I can press S to scale this out and we'll start to shape the body. And again, like we did the head, pretty much we rotate the viewport gradually with the middle mouse button and then just move them with G, slide them, press Control R to introduce loop cuts where you need them. And then we can start to get the shape. And usually I like to stick to these cartoony <laughs> proportions so I put little chubby bellies on them or skinny legs or skinny arms and things like that and we're going to be colorizing this later on as well and I know, I'm realizing now that the feet are a little bit too narrow so I select the sides of this hold the shift key to multi-select there and press s to scale them and press x to scale them on the x-axis there and then I want to create a bit of a boot here so I press Control r to create a, a loop cut there and another Control r to, to do a loop cut that I scale down to get the size of a boot and and then I press Control R by the knee because we're going to need another fold here. So when we when we deform this character, we need a little bit more geometry there. So when it's actually bending the leg, I mentioned you don't want it to be like a stilt. So that's why we have that one there. I'm going to make the bottom of the feet even flatter as well. Again, like the cartoony look on these. So we have to do the same process for the arms. So Control R by the elbow and then resize that a little bit down. And then press Control R by the wrist because uh, we need the deformation geometry here. Be careful so you don't add a loop cut like this on the side. Even though it's tempting to add the geometry, it's going to create a lot of problems later on. So try to stick to the low poly look and just add the loop cuts around the limbs, like the arms and the legs, instead of going for the full thing. Because otherwise you get tempted to start putting loads of polygons on this character. So move the chest in a little bit and the back in. And uh, think about, uh, uh, this has just come with practice when I've been playing around with the, the way the characters are posed. So I try to get a little S-curve on the back and... Uh, for the legs, it's important to get a little dent by the kneecap there. So when we deform the legs later on, we're going to have to make sure that they fold correctly with the inverse kinematics, it's called. So it's important here. I go into edge select mode and I alt click on this uh, on this edge here, or control alt click it is to do a ring select in this case instead of loop. And then I slide it on the y axis to get a little natural bend on the knee. And it's important you don't want to have super straight legs because again, when you animate later on, they might flip in the wrong direction. Then. And then I do the same for the arm here, I, by the elbow, I in edge select mode, I hold control and alt and I clicked on one of these edges here and then that ring selects all the way around and I slide it back to get a little natural curve around the elbow. And this again, it's going to make it easier later on when we animate so the legs just don't flip out and start bending the knee in the wrong direction. <laughs> and uh, again, rotate the viewport and uh, make sure you tweak a little bit here and there until you're pretty happy with uh, what you see.
All right, so I'm pretty happy with the way the character looks now, so let's put a bit of a splash on color on him. So I press 3 to go into face select and press A to select all the faces and hover the mouse over the left side now and make sure that they're selected as well. You might have to press A and press G to move that little orange dot now and that'll move all the faces. I put them on a skin tone there and that just colorizes the entire character. Hold the Alt key in and press on an edge like this on the torso and then press Control plus on the numpad to grow the selection. So we cover the torso, the arms and the legs. And then I have to hold the Alt and Shift key and remove some of the selection on the head because I just want the clothing area now. And then again, move the mouse cursor over to the left side over the UVs and press G and move it from the skin tone onto a color of the clothing. And let's just pick something red here. So it's a bit of a like a big pajamas or a jumpsuit <laughs> or a furry or something. I don't know. But let's start here. So now we, we've got uh, some basic colorations and this is going to be super easy for us to colorize the character. So select under the feet, the faces, press control plus on the numpad to grow the selection. And then we can move it from the skin tone onto a black, for example, for black boots. And this is how we go about to color all the characters. Hold alt and click on the edge like this and loop select around the leg and up towards the side or around the torso and then shift select these uh, triangles that weren't caught. And then I can uh, move this one to a brown pair of pants and I actually missed the face under the crotch <laughs> area now. So he's got a bit of a red patch there between his legs, but let's just ignore that for now. <laughs> I spotted that later on. We can continue to reshape the character even though we're in the colorization phase. If we see stuff that needs tweaking, just uh, toggle between uh, the different edge or face or vertex select modes and tweak the vertices and, and the polygons as you need. Here we might want to put a belt here now. So when I'm still in editing mode now, we can move this onto a black color here and just pretend that this is a belt. And either you can just, uh, I like to keep it super low poly like this. So I just colorize it like this because they look good enough. And it's up to you if you want to start to add some additional polygons to extrude the belt. I do that for some of my characters if I want a little bit more of a shading or details. And lately though, for the super simple low poly ones, I just colorized it like this. If you wanted to extrude it, you can alt click on the edge like this and select the faces around it. Press alt E and extrude along face normals and that it'll extrude all the faces out in the way their normals are facing. Press control plus on the numpad and then I can change the selection here and on the left I scale it down to zero all of those vertices and that creates a bit of an extruded belt but for this character I don't think that's necessary so I control Z out of that and I'm just going to stick to it like this super simple and just have the black polygons around the belt there. I'm pretty happy with the, the way that looks and we can just work along from here. Now is probably a good time to save, so I go to File and Save As, and I just give it a name here. And for my tutorial tier patrons, you can actually download this blend file if you want already. So you can play around with it. I'll save it in different stages here. Then we can add some fake shading. So if I select around the tip of the arm here, or the sleeve, and I, I'll just move these to some darker red, and wherever there's natural shading or dark areas, for example, that's a good spot, then you can just uh, make sure that you lower the tone a little bit to a deeper red in that case. Even for my standards, the jaw is poking out a little bit, so let's move that back in. Maybe not quite that much, so I'll press G to move it in a little bit, and from the top view, I'll press R to rotate it and get a bit of a more natural slant so we don't have uh, <laughs> the jaw sticking out too much. Now we're going to do the eye, and I usually do that as separate geometry. So I select this uh, front face here, just above the cheeks, and I press Shift D to duplicate it, and it's sticking to the center, and it's because we have clipping enabled. So if you look on the right side now under the modifier here, I can disable clipping and then I can press S to scale it down and it's not glued to the center like that and I can move it into place. And you want to re-enable clipping at some point so you don't forget it, but first I'll extrude it. I'll press E to extrude the eye a little bit and just get something that looks a little bit like an eye. <laughs> and then you can just shape it to the way you want it. I press uh, G to slide it and you can press G twice actually to slide it along the edge. That'll keep the proportions there and I move it up and I just like to have these little vertical looking eyes and remember to enable clipping again because otherwise you'll regret it later on <laughs> when your mesh starts to break apart in the center. And hover over the geometry there and press L. That will select all the linked geometry and since the eye is detached from the other part of the mesh, they'll just select the eye. On the left side, hover over the coordinates there and press G and move it onto black. And we have a set of eyes here that's pretty suitable for this character. I can move them in on the x-axis a little bit closer and then you can scale them. I like to have them a little bit tall like this so it's not round eyes. I, I like to keep these little uh, 
like, I don't know, tall looking centered eyes on the head like this. This is pretty much how I do all the eyes. And I usually don't add anything more onto the faces. I don't do noses and I don't do mouths because I don't think they suit the style. What I do, some sometimes I put facial hair like beards and stuff, but they look a bit spooky if you start putting like a static, uh, just <laughs> open mouth on them or something. So I'm pretty happy with just keeping the eye look, but that's uh, just my preference. If you like to add and model faces, go ahead, you can do it. <laughs> it's definitely possible, so it's up to you. I also renamed the character now instead of having him named Cube all the time, <laughs> even though I've got a lot of characters named Cube. Press F2 on it just to rename it, and then usually I press Shift D to duplicate, and I just hide a copy of it as well. So even though I've saved the file, I like to keep a pretty basic template to start off where that I can just go back to if necessary. So I usually just uh, hide it with the little icon there on the right. Now just to show you, we can have some fun with this character. I select all the faces by clicking A, and on the left I'll just mark around the red vertices and I move them onto blue, and we've changed the top color to blue. And likewise, I'll box select around the brown vertices here and move them down to blue jeans or pink pants or, well, whatever color you want. So you can quickly change the colors on a character like this, so when you start making clones, you'll knock them out <laughs> in no time. Another thing we can do is uh, let's modify this and play around with the character geometry a little bit. And on the arm here, for example, around the sleeve, if I hold the Alt key and click on one of the edge in ed edge select here, we'll do a loop selection. And then you can press X, and this is to delete or dissolve, and we'll do dissolve edges. And that actually removes the edges there. You can see how they just disappeared. And those weren't necessarily super necessary on this uh, character at the moment, except maybe good for deformation. If we remove this one too, then you see that it just cuts it all the way down to the wrist. And then you start to see this little red shade here. And if we look on the left side, it's actually gradiently sliding from, from where we had the dark red onto the bright red. And th you're gonna notice this, especially, let's do it here. If we select the edge loop around the wrist and dissolve that X and, and select dissolve, you can see that it's uh, sliding across all the gradients here. And if we zoom in on the left side on the UVs, it's because it's spanning across. You can scale this down by pressing S and then press zero on the keyboard and then hit return and then we can pl place that uh, somewhere and that will actually solidify the color back to where you want it. And uh, this is going to be important when you start modifying the characters later on that you know why it's going gradient like that. So again, mark the stuff that's going gradient, scale it down to zero and then hit enter and then you can move it. And in this case, maybe you want a short sleeved shirt so I can put that back onto the skin tone. Shift select the, the skin tone color to see where you've actually placed that skin tone and then you can select around the new area and drag it down roughly to be in the same place to match that skin tone in this case. Could also be if you want to match the color top or the shoe, shoe colors or whatever. Let's add some geometry with Control R for loop cuts again and select this so we can create a, a bit of an arm that looks like a t-shirt. And if you press G to slide uh, like this, you can press G again and that slides it handily <laughs> across uh, or along the edges. So that's another handy one. G, G, like good game, <laughs> slides stuff along the edges. So let's slide it up and then control R and then scale it down with S. And I'm realizing now that these arms are super long. In fact, they're way too long for this character. I didn't really spot that before, but now I'm realizing it's like uh, Pinocchio's nose, except it's just the arms. So I think I'll have to fix that. All right, so we'll have to address those arm <laughs> arms in a little bit. They have to be shortened. But before I do that, let's uh, play around a little bit more with the shape. First, I'll uh, Alt select on this edge here and uh, color that uh, so it's part of the T-shirt. So we we'll go for the darker red to simulate a bit of shading there. And now we're going to reshape the arm a little bit. And again, use a lot of Alt key and clicking on, uh, on on edges to get loop selects. And then press S to scale them. And then select different edges like this. Uh, and, Selecting around the shoulders, let like make a, make a, <laughs> a few muscles on this guy, and press G to slide it around. And then uh, again, you can do different things like Alt clicking on the edges to get save yourself a bit of time. You can also enable proportional editing if you want. Uh, remember that's the O hot key if you want, and use the mouse wheel. Uh, that'll save you some time if you want to change the overall shape of. In this case, I want to beef up the arms a little bit, so I press S to scale it with proportional. Use the mouse wheel to change the area of how much it affects it. Press Control R to add loop cuts, and then try not to go overboard, but add enough loop cuts and enough geometry so you can have the shape that you want. So remember, S to scale is your friend, and G to move stuff around. Proportional editing is really good. Control R to add loop cuts is really handy. 
and then just play around with it. And uh, now we've suddenly got from that uh, semi skinny guy, we've got a bit of a beefy guy now with some spent uh, most of his days uh, just uh, bench pressing stuff. Apparently, he didn't care about the legs. <laughs> Uh, so you can have a lot of fun with just uh, creating a lot of different characters and see how quickly you, when you get the hang of this, uh, I'm doing it uh, pretty slow now for the tutorial, when you get the hang of this and when you've done 10, 20, 30 characters, you're going to be able to do, I think some of the characters that I make uh, take like five minutes to make from, from the template. And the beautiful thing is that they're all going to fit the style that you've created from the first one. So if you're making a game or making assets for a game or a little mini video or something, they're all going to match it. And I, I'd like I'd love to play around with the proportions. So in this case, let's scale down the legs even further. He, he not only did he skip the leg day, he in, invertently like did them backwards or something. He, he rested his legs instead, rest day on the legs, and then just kept pumping iron on the top. Also, sometimes uh, around the neck here, you can press Control R to add a, a loop cut around. Uh, imagine this is like a T-shirt. Select the faces and change the color. Remember, you can select the, one of the skin tone colors to get a matching, and then box select around uh, those ones and move them down to the same place. You get a bit of a v-neck there. You can just have a lot of fun with this. Change the colors. Now he's suddenly got a belly top, so we put skin tone on the belly as well. This is uh, get, getting a bit out of hand now. Uh, <laughs> I'm not so sure uh, where I'm heading with this, to be honest. So we've got a beefy guy now with uh, a very uh, questionable top here. S super skinny legs. Uh, I think I'll have to cancel out of this one, so let's just delete this guy. <laughs> And then uh, we remember we did a shift D duplicate of this one. So let's enable our template again. And then we can just uh, uh, do it. another shift D to duplicate this one, store him to the side a little bit, hide him. And then uh, that was just to demonstrate how quickly you can start modifying these later on. I think we need to fix the length uh, of these arms now. They just feel like they're too long. So I'd probably run into problems if I started to animate this. So from the front view of the character, it's actually the back orthographic view. Uh, funny enough, press Alt Z to enable X ray mode. And then if you hold, either you can box select, press B and box select like this, and then just move them back. And when we have X ray enabled, it goes all the way through the mesh. You can also hold the control key and hold the right mouse button down, and that'll lasso select around something. If it doesn't work with box select, for B for box select, you can use the lasso instead, and then press G and then just move it up to maybe that's a little bit better proportions for our arms. They were just way too long before super long, elastic, elasto man. <laughs> and you can toggle out of the x-ray mode there with Alt Z so you don't see through it anymore. So this looks a little bit better for our low poly character. No more long arms. Since we made uh, changes to the arms that are quite significant, I'm going to update the little duplicate. So I'll delete the old uh, hidden clone that we had and I'll just make a Shift D duplicate of this one and hide it again so we have uh, one with the correct arms so you don't <laughs> accidentally enable the long-armed version later on. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, props and clothing and hats in particular. And there are multiple ways you can add hats to the characters and also backpacks and things like that. To demonstrate, I'm going to select the top faces here of the head. And uh, one method is to do Shift D to duplicate it. And if I scale it now, you see that it looked like it was part of the head, but that's because we have proportional editing. So I'll have to disable that. And now when I press G and or if I scale it, it actually just scales the new ones there. So let's make a bit of a like a baseball cap thing here. So I extruded that a little bit uh, with Alt E to extrude along phase normals, and uh, that solidifies the cap a little bit. It still looks a bit weird. It just looks like something <laughs> plumped onto his head. So we have to reshape this a little bit, but this approach is actually creating a separately geometry-based hat. So I'll select the outer edges here of uh, the hat so I can scale them out and move them down a little bit. So first let's move them down, move them out in the X uh, direction, and then scale them along the Y axis. And then I'll select the bottom faces here and I'll extrude them. I'll press E to extrude them downwards for the cap and then S to scale them up. And you can shape the cap in whatever way you want. If I select the front edge here, move it down, select the front face and press E to extrude and scale it with S and then move it in with G and then I can press rotate from the front view there and shape it a little bit into a cap. And then I'll move the back down a little bit and you can again, just like we did with the character, toggle between one, two, three, the edge and the vertex and the face mode and then just tweak it to your liking. Now you have to be a little bit careful because you've got a head inside that cap, so you can't really deform it in whichever way you want because it might start poking through. We'll color it in the same way we did with the other stuff. So I select all the faces and on the left side, I hover over the 
coordinates and I press G and move them to a blue cap. And now suddenly we've got a separately based geometry hat. So it's got some pros and cons. The pro with having a separate cap like this is that you could detach it. So if you wanted to take it off, for example, then you could do that. But the problem that we have is if I move it in, we start to have internal geometry that causes problems. So you have to be careful. So in that, this case, it's the cap's interior, but it could also, also be the head that's poking through like this. So that's one of the issues that you have to take into consideration if you're going to do separate geometry like this. The benefit of having a separate hat like this is that you can move it off. You could create a separate object. If I press P and separate by selection, it actually takes it off the character right there and creates a separate one. We can press uh, just F2 to rename this one and call it hat. And in a game engine, this could be a separate object that you just uh, parent to the head. It'll automatically follow the head around. And if you have a ragdoll or something and you want to knock the hat off, you can just detach that cap and set it to not have a parent and then just add some physics to it and it'll fly off. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. If you plan to be able to detach the caps and stuff, you want to do that. And notice how the, it inherited the pivot point at the bottom there, the feet of the character. So you'd probably want to change that to have the pivot point in the center of the hat instead. So we're starting to add a bit of extra time now to take care of this. But if I right click and do set the origin, it'll flip out because we've got the mirror modifier on. And that's based on that the origin should be in the center of the. So there's a little tweak we can do to fix that. There's a way we can do this. If I go into vertex select mode and I select one of the front vertices here and shift select one of the back ones, I can press shift S and then go cursor to selected. That puts the 3D cursor where the center of those two vertices are. And once the cursor is there, the 3D cursor, I can tab out of the edit mode, right click and do set origin, origin to 3D cursor. And now it's actually set the correct rotational or origin for this cap. So it's uh, better for the game engine that it's uh, that got a pivot point roughly by its mass center. It's not exactly, but it's pretty good. If I move the hat up, I can select uh, the interior faces here, hold the shift key down, and then I can move the color so we get uh, a dark blue in there. Again, it's like a fake shading method that I use usually to do interiors of hats. So it looks a little bit more shaded or natural. We can also select the front faces here and change the colors to have a bit of a black cap and you could just do loads of different caps this way if you wanted. So this method is to do the separate geometry and uh, now we'll look at the alternative. The alternative is to model it into the character itself. So I'll press Control R here and put another loop cut here and I'll select one of the front faces and I'll just extrude the cap from here. I'll do the same like before from the front view, I'll press R to rotate and G to move it down a little bit. And then at the back of the head, I'll select one of the edges and just slide it down on the head so it fits the head a little bit better. And that's how simple it is to make one that's attached to the head. So you can't take that one off in the game engine, but the benefit is that it's uh, not going to cause a lot of extra work or problems. I can select the faces with a shift and uh, just color it the way I did before, blue cap, and then move the vertices on the left by pressing G and sliding those vertices onto the black cap. Very quick to do it this way. And the limitation, of course, is that you cannot take the cap off. And in a similar fashion, we can also add hair this way. I press tab into edit mode again on the object. I press three to go to face select. I shift select a bunch of faces here around the head. And then I, on the left side, press G and move those vertices. And suddenly we've created a hair color. Sometimes you want to extrude these for a little bit of a, a thicker look. So if I select the faces again and press Alt E, extrude face along normals, then it'll slide them out. And then I have to press either Control plus on the keypad, or in this case, I select them manually. And then you can press, select them on the left there on the UVs and then move them into place. I missed the top there, but you get the gist of it. And that way you can start creating a little thicker hair. So see the blue line there should have been uh, differently, but Let's just cancel out of that one, Control Z, and go back to the way we were. So we've covered a little bit now how you can do the caps in two different ways. And we're going to stick to this cap now, the one that's integrated to the head. I think in most cases, that's going to be perfectly fine. You start to venture out of, into scope creep if you want to start doing detachable caps, and you might take more time than you need. We can also do a K, which is a knife tool. And if you press K, you can randomly click a little bit where you want the edges to go. And this way we add some geometry so we can color it a bit differently. Otherwise you might be limited to just have what uh, the polygons that are already there are doing. Knife tool is really handy to get custom shapes and uh, you can really start to get the look that you want now of the polygons, but you have to be a little bit careful as well 
the way you add them because sometimes it can affect the way the character deforms. So keep an eye out from that later on. If you have a lot of knife cuts along your character, it might uh, be a bit of a penalty on that when you start to deform the mesh that it <laughs> moves a bit strange. But it starts to really add a lot of flexibility to the way we can do hair and also clothing on the characters. But I'll control Z out of this one again and we'll just leave it super simple and plain like this one. If you want to remove the cap of a character, you can select the faces and just press X or delete and do just delete the faces. And that'll uh, <laughs> leave a big hole in the head, but uh, don't panic too much when this happens. You can actually quite easily repair it. In edge select mode, two on the keyboard, hold shift and select the top faces. And then you can E to extrude them up and then press the F key. And that'll actually fill an empty hole like this. And that's how quickly you can just repair a broken mesh like this. So extrusion and using the F key will uh, seal the holes like this, and that's how quickly you can remove a cap. So again, don't be afraid sometimes if you need to do some operations like that. But I think we'll keep the cap, so we'll control Z back <laughs> and put the cap back. Just wanted to show you how quickly you could actually fix something like that if you did want to remove it. So far, everything we've done with a character has involved symmetry, and sometimes you want to do stuff that's not symmetrical. For example, if I wanted to put a little patch here, like a name tag on this character, I'll select the chest face here and I'll press I to inset. Then we get an additional face here. And uh, if I change the color on this one on the left side, I'll put G and move it to white. You can see he's only got a pair of headlights on his top instead of a name tag. And we don't really want that. So I'll control Z out of that. And in the mirror modifier, we'll have to tab out of edit mode and then press control A over the modifier to apply it. And now when I do the inset and then change the color, then we've not got symmetry enabled anymore so I can start to add my custom little logos and patches and things like that. And also if you wanna do the knife tool, for example, if you wanna do something like uh, something that's hanging over the shoulder, then a strap of some sort, you can use the K key for the knife tool, add this strap the way you want it. And when we colorize these now, we can select the faces and uh, just what we've done before as usual, on the left side, press G to move them onto black in this case, and we've created a strap that's going across the shoulder there. So if you don't want symmetry at in as late as possible in the process, you wanna apply the mirror modifier and then start modifying the meshes. Most of my characters are symmetrical, but some, some things like zombies and things, and sometimes soldiers and stuff, you want to disable the symmetry so you can make them a little bit uh, different, especially if you want stuff that's cutting across. And now we're uh, pretty happy with our character now. It's uh, facing in the right direction. Everything is, seems to be in place here. So I think we're good to go. All right, now we're gonna create an armature, which is basically like a skeleton for this character, which will allow us to animate it. Make sure that the cursor is at the center origin of the scene, 0.0.0, .0 and then press Shift A and add a new armature. And the bone is gonna be placed here at the bottom. And we wanna go in and change the viewport uh, display here to say in front. So make sure you do that setting because then you'll be able to see, see it through the character. Then we tab into edit mode and we select this bone, not the entire armature, just the bone. And then I do shift space G and then I get this little gizmo and we can move it up along the blue Z axis here. And then I'm gonna take the top part of the bone and drag it down. And we're gonna create this little pelvis bone here and place it just by the pelvis. This is gonna be the root bone of our character that we're gonna be extruding everything else from. Select the top one and press E to extrude and then press the middle mouse button to snap it onto the Z axis and then place it roughly in the middle of the spine and then do E to extrude again and bring it up to the neck and then E to extrude again and remember the middle mouse button to snap it to the blue axis and then put it to the top of the head. Now I'm gonna select this bone here on top of the spine bone and E to extrude it out and this is gonna be our shoulder bone and see that it's attached now and I'm gonna escape out of that one. We're gonna press Alt P here to disconnect the bone because we want to move this independently. Now when we press G, we can move it out to where the clavicle would be roughly. Let's uh, reposition it here inside the body and then select the tip, do E to extrude and go to the elbow, E to extrude again and go to the wrist and then E to go out to the through the hand as well. That's going to be the, our final bone. If we look from the side here, there are a few alternatives here. You could rig this hand and put more bones than one. We're going to be just just using one bone for this character, but you could theoretically also extrude these finger bones. If you want to be able to grip weapons and uh, other items, you could do that. And also you'd have to extrude the thumb and do Alt-P to disconnect that one and put a couple of bones in a thumb. 
It's a bit fiddly to position them. You have to rotate the viewport and uh, do some uh, G to move them around. But something like this could do with a single finger to control the palm and also the thumb. But I think for this uh, one, we don't really need this level of detail. But the parenting there is pretty important as well. So you can see the hierarchy that the finger and the thumb bone would have to be parented to, uh, by the hand bone. But again, we'll control Z out of that because we're just going to be using a single hand bone here and keep the hand static. That's going to work for 99% of our cases for the type of game that we'd be going for. Then I select the pelvis one or the tip where I extrude it. And uh, we're going to drag that one straight down, snap it to the axis with the middle mouse button. Do Alt P and disconnect this bone and press G to move it and put the top where the hip is and make sure that the bottom is by the knee. E to extrude down to the foot and E to extrude again to the bottom of the foot. And from the side view now, we're going to be moving these bones a little bit. It's very important that you put the knee a little bend to it there because when the inverse kinematics is going to be animated later on, it needs to have a little tendency to flip in the right direction. And then we move the foot bone into this little weird angle here. So it's by the top of the heel to the tip of the toe, roughly. Then I also put a little natural S-curve to the spine. So I just try to select the spine bones and press G to move them into place. And also the neck bone, some minor refinements. And then for the elbow, same as we did with the knee, select the joint by the elbow, press G to move it back. And I use that from the top view here. And this should be pretty good for our main uh, structure or the hierarchy. Then we're going to name the bone. So select the pelvis bone there and press F2. And I'm going to name this one to pelvis. Select the first spine bone and press F2 and name this one spine 1. And then this one above we'll name to spine 2. Press F2 on the head bone, name this one head. Press F2 on the shoulder and name this one shoulder dot L. Very important with a dot L naming here. And then on the upper arm we'll name this one upper arm dot L. Again very important with a dot L. And then we do lower arm dot L. And we're going to have hand dot L. The L dot L is going to help us to symmetrize this in a minute. Then we name the upper leg bone to upper leg dot L. Then we do lower leg dot L. And finally, we also do the foot and we call this one foot dot L. And I'm going to show you why it's so important to name them dot L. If I do A to select all the bones while we're in edit mode, press F3 and type symmetrize. And magically, it will just create the arm bones and the leg bones. And uh, it'll take the dot L and just change that to dot R. And that saves us all the work of doing one of the sides. So that's why we're using this naming scheme of dot L when we created the left side bones of this armature. But before we symmetrize this, we're going to be adding a few inverse kinematics bones. And if you don't want know what inverse kinematics is, to animate legs without IK would be very problematic. You would basically have to select the legs. And if I press control tab and go into pose mode here, which is what we're going to be using to pose the character. And you can see when I rotate the spine, it works. But if I lower the pelvis down, then the feet sink through the floor. And it would be very problematic to animate the character in a walk cycle if you don't have inverse kinematics. Because by default, it's called forward kinematics. And you would have to manually try to rotate the legs and place the feet. And when you change the height of the character, the way how high it is up in the air, you'd have to manually try to tweak the legs. To fix this, we're going to cl click on the kneecap bone in edit mode and do E to extrude. And then select that bone and do Alt P and do clear parent and then press G to move it in a little bit to the front. Select this joint down by the heel and E to extrude that one, Alt P and do clear parent but leave this one exactly where it is. This one we're going to be going into this uh, bone tab and unclick deform and same thing for this bottom one here by the heel. These are going to be helper bones for the inverse kinematics. And we don't want those to be deforming the character. It's very easy to forget those. And you have to do them manually as well, one by one. You can't select both and change it because it'll only change it on one then. And here comes a very important step. Press Control numpad 1 to go to the front view of the character. Press A to select all the bones and press Shift N. And under Other, select View Axis. This will align all the bones and the axes to be aligned towards the front view. So when we paste mirrored poses later on, they will end up correct. If you paste a mirrored pose later on and the arms are poking in the wrong direction or the leg, it's because you forgot this step. So very important from the front view to do this. Now I'm going to show you how to set up the inverse kinematics. So select the lower leg, lower leg dot L, and then press control tab and go into pose mode. And on the right side, when you've gone into pose mode, you should see this little blue bone icon. And if you click on this one, 
it'll bring up a few new options and we're going to add a bone constraint and we're going to add inverse kinematics. And up here, we're going to change a few parameters to get this set up correctly. First, we're going to click on this target field and select the armature. And then for bone, we can see that I haven't actually named the bones correctly yet. So we should really do that one to help us along a little bit better. So to do this, well, control tab into edit mode again. And then this bone by the heel, we'll name iktarget.l. And this one in front, we're going to press F2 and rename this one to ikpole.l. And these two bones are going to help us to set up the inverse kinematics. So control tab and go back into pose mode. And now we can pick for the target bone here. We actually pick the target.l bone. And for the pole target, we select the armature again. And for the bone itself, we pick ikpole.l. And that flips out our armature. Don't get afraid. This is uh, perfectly normal if it tilts this like this, but we're going to fix that right now. Under chain length, set this one to two because it's going to be controlling two limbs. But now the leg is poking in the wrong direction and we have to change the pole angle to 90 now and that should flip the foot in the right direction. If it doesn't flip it in the right direction, you've done something wrong with the, the shift N step that we did before. So reverse a little bit and make sure that 90 degrees will poke it to the front. Otherwise, you'll end up in problems later on. Now, when I select the pelvis bone and move that down, you can see that the foot is actually staying in place, but it's tilting down. So we still have some work to do here to get the foot to rotate correctly. And also the foot doesn't rotate the way we want it. So I'll control Z out of this and we're going to fix it. So select the foot bone.l. And for this bone, we're going to go into this little bone tab here, the green bone and expand relations and untick inherit rotation. Now, when we're lowering the pelvis, the foot is not going to be rotating anymore. But we have to be able to rotate the foot <laughs> and we should really be able to control that with this little bo bone by the heel that we also use to control the position with. And to fix this, we go to the select the foot bone again and then we add a constraint here and this constraint is going to be the copy rotation. And we have to select the target and it's going to be the armature and the bone that we select is going to be the iktarget.l. Now it's poking in the wrong direction suddenly, and that's also perfectly normal because it's copying it from world space. So we change the target here from world space to local space and the owner from world space to local space. And now it's nearly done, but when we rotate the target bone, it's actually rotating in the incorrect rotation because it's flipped 180 degrees. And the only axis that's actually correct is this one around the Z axis. So that's the only one that's actually rotating correctly since it's mirrored and the, the bones are actually aligned in different directions. To fix this, we have to select the foot bone again and under here, we change to invert the X and the Y axis. Now when we ro rotate this target bone, we can rotate it around the X axis and around the Z axis and also around the Y axis and it follows the rotation that we expect when we rotate it, when we animate our character. And now everything should be set up so when we lower the pelvis, the foot stays and we can rotate the foot independently when we animate the character. Now you can do control tab and go into edit mode and press A to select everything. And finally, we're ready to press F3 and right symmetrize and hit enter on this. And now we've got our fully configured armature for this character and we're going to be ready to animate this. We can test it again, control tab, go into post mode, move it around, see that the feet are working. Let's rotate the arms, all looks good. The head looks good. Now it's time to save again and make sure that we get a new version here so you can follow along. If you're a patron on the tutorial tier, you'll be able to download all these different part files if you wanna jump in at a specific position. Now that we've finished creating the armature, we can parent our low poly character to the armature itself and bring it to life. Select the character and then shift select the armature and press Control P. And set parent to, and under armature deform, select with automatic weights. And that does an incredibly magic job <laughs> of reparenting this character now. If I press Control Tab and go into post mode, when we rotate the arm bone here, for example, you can see that the character is deforming beautifully. The hands work, the lower arm works. If I rotate it, and we're low poly now, so we're gonna get some stretching, but overall, I think it does an excellent job. We rotate the head, we lower the pelvis and see that the legs work really good too. We can rotate the foot, lift the foot and see everything seems to be working pretty good. And it's not going to require a lot of tweaking. And most cases, you could even leave it exactly like this without hardly any tweaks at all. There could always be improvements, but to save time, and if you're going to do a lot of characters and it's good enough, then 
I think the automatic deform usually works really, really well. And here you can see on the knee, which is why we needed those little extra pieces of geometry. If I select this one, I go into edit mode, I remove and dissolve one of the lines here around the knee. You can see that the deformation is a lot more severe here by the knee, especially behind the knee there. It really folds it with just one line. If we were to have no line there at all, it wouldn't even be able to deform it at all. If we take away the ones down here by the feet, we get the little uh, discoloration issue there. But you see how important that little piece of extra geometry is. If I control Z all the way back, now we can see that we get a pretty good deformation around the knee and it keeps the shape pretty good. You could always, there's some specific workflows that you could do to improve this even further. But I think uh, just a double loop cut there is pretty good. It's going to serve you pretty well in most cases. One place that you might find on these low poly characters that you have some issues is on the eyes. Since we created that with separate geometry and you cannot really tell so much from it here, but usually the eyes lag behind a little bit and you'll probably notice it in some severe cases when you move the head around. And some cases for some objects, it'd be worse than others. And I recommend that you always do this little fix. Press tab and get into the edit mode of the mesh. Press L to select all the vertices of the eye and then press control G and then here we're going to do remove from all and that clears all the weight data from all the vertices on the eye here so it's not going to be connected to anything press ctrl g again set active group to head and you won't see much of a difference here but we're actually selecting the active group to be the head press ctrl g once again and then assign to active group now we've actually made sure that all the 100% of the weight of the skeleton is going to be affected by the head now for the eyes. So when we rotate it now, it looks pretty similar, but now we can guarantee that the eyes are 100% following the head. That method is also useful if you have things like backpack and you want to assign that to with a spine or if you have a hat, everything like that, just use that method to ensure that it's fully weight painted. In edit mode and in vertex mode, if you select the vertex and look up in the top right of the viewport under item, you can actually see the vertex weights. And if you click on a vertex, you can see head here, for example, has got different types of assignments when you click on them. And the number there is between zero and one, and that's uh, between zero and 100% how much that bone is gonna be affecting this vertex when it's moved. One area where you might actually run into a few issues on characters like these is up on the top of the leg by the hip there. You can see when you move the leg that it's really poking out on the hip there. And uh, sometimes you, you get away with it. You can keep it like that. But if you really want to have it uh, a little bit better than this, then you have to go into weight painting mode. And to get it into weight painting mode, you select the armature and then shift click with the left mouse button on the character itself. Press control tab and go to weight paint. And now you can see if it's a blue color, it means that a particular bone isn't affecting that area at all. And it fades all the way through green, yellow, and red to where it affects the most. You can hold the shift key and click on a bone and see how much this affects it. And if I select the upper left leg here, you can see that it affects the hip there a little bit. You've still got some green. So you can change the strength just at the top here of the viewport and the weight. And what we need to do is reduce the weight now from 1.0, which is the default. Slide that one all the way down to zero. And then we need to bring the cursor in, rotate the viewport a little bit with the middle mouse button. And then right on the hip there now, we need to find it and uh, just click and hold the left mouse button and reduce the weight paint here. And it could be a bit scary. You might uh, actually paint on the wrong one. So be a little bit careful here. Keep trying to figure out where the vertices are and then find them and then gradually remove the weight from there until if you feel happy with it. And this might take some practice, but by the end of it, you can uh, control tab out of this and into uh, pose mode again and object mode and see how it affects it. But, uh, you can use control Z if you go a little bit too far. And uh, you can also do, if I now increase the weight a little bit to half as much and I repaint it back a little bit to see what it looks like. And then I press control tab and now when we go back into the normal edit mode here, we can see that it uh, looks a little bit better on the bum cheek there, on the back or on the hip. But maybe we still have a little bit too much effect on the front of the leg there. So it's uh, really down to personal preference and you might have to fiddle a little bit until you get the right gradient there. Okay, so just to recap on the weight painting here, you can select the armature, shift select the character, the order is important, control tab and go to weight painting mode. And then when you shift and left click onto a bone, it'll show how much weight that bone is applying to the mesh. Some of the bone here show up as 
pink or purple on the mesh, and that's because they are not deformed bones. Those are our IK helper bones, and they're not set to deform the mesh at all. Dark blue means that it has no effect. Green to yellow to orange to red means that it's got maximum effect. Multiple bones can affect the same vertex. And like I said, most of the time I don't really do too much changing here, and often none at all. So if you're happy with it, if it's good enough for your game or your purpose, I would just leave it alone. But if you need to, you can come in here and do some tweaking. Something that can be a bit tricky is if you have longer clothes, like a, a robe or a long dress or something. So let's try that out. And I'll just make a copy, a shift D here on the character and hide one of them. So we have a backup copy. And then I'm going to click on this little eye icon there to hide the armature. And then I press uh, tab into edit mode. And let's just modify this mesh a little bit. So from what we've learned before, we can do all those operations. Control R to do a loop cut in this case. We can, uh, I'm going a little bit quicker here just to show you what we can do. I press Control R again and I scale and I press G to move these vertices and edges around. So I'm going to make it a little bit skinnier here so we can fit uh, a robe around this character. And usually the way I do it is that around the waist here, I put some loop cuts so I get uh, an edge around the waist here that we can use for the, for the dress or the robe. You have to make sure now that you narrow down the legs a little bit because you don't want them poking through the clothes. So I go around here and I scale down the legs quite a lot and around the bum area and the hips. And then I select the edge again uh, around the dress and I E to extrude it, and I do it a couple of times. You want those loop cuts around the dress there as well, or the robe, <laughs> because uh, it needs to be able to deform, and I scale it out. And again, some of the key things here is keep the legs skinny underneath there and the hips, because the skinnier they are, the better. You won't really see them anyway, and you really want to try to minimize the risk of them poking through later on. The key thing when you model is uh, use the middle mouse button, rotate around your character, use Alt-Z to see through, and uh, just to make sure that you pull out vertices and edges so you get a good shape on your clothing or on your character. And with this x-ray mode, it can be a little bit tricky to see inside. So again, I, I recommend that you twist around the viewport with the middle mouse button so you can sort of identify from a depth perspective which line is which. When you extrude like this, usually the interior there catches the color that was inside, so you might want to catch those and colorize them. Here's the trick. I select the leg now and in edit mode, and then I press H to hide it. The H key will hide that geometry. It's not deleted, but now we can see much clearer inside when we need to edit the interior of this mesh here. And then I select the interior faces there, and I also select one of the red exterior faces, and then I select the vertices on the UV side on the left there. I press S and type 0 to scale them down to 0. And then I move them onto the red there. And I go for a little darker red there so it looks more like a, a shaded uh, color. And then I do Alt-H to unhide it. So the legs are still there, luckily enough. And nothing, no harm was done to them. It was just uh, making it a lot easier to do the interior there. That also works for weight painting if you need to hide geometry like that when you do the weight painting if it's in the way. Since I extruded the long clothing there, it just copied the vertex weights. So I'm going to select the character, shift select the armature, do control P and do the armature deform with automatic weights again. And let's see how good of a job it does. Now when we go into post mode with control tab, we can see that it did a pretty good job actually. The uh, It's catching a few of the weights from the legs so as the character is bending it's just uh, penetrating a little bit through there and again you can probably get away with that most of the time you're never going to get it perfect there's always going to be animations that you're not going to be able to uh, to prevent that from happening but i think most of the time it's pretty okay especially when legs go into extreme positions like poking straight out or straight back uh, you're always going to have them coming through the only way to avoid that happening would be to create bones for the longer clothing and animate that separately, but that takes a lot longer. So you have to be prepared for probably quadrupling or even tenfolding the workload if you start to add bones to the clothing. And if you can get away with it, I recommend just making it good enough. I go into weight painting here to see if we can make any changes to it. And uh, when we see here, we can see that the, the legs here I'm increasing the weight a little bit on the longer clothing. And you can edit that while it's actually in the post position there. So as I paint in the weight, we could see that it actually saved the clothing there. It popped out from penetrating through the bones there. And that's pretty good. Uh, we've got some issue there on the hip that we can see. 
So we should really fix that one too. And that can usually be fixed by editing the interior mesh. It doesn't really matter how skinny that is. So I can press tab and go into edit mode there, Alt Z, so we see through. And then I select the interior edges there and just narrow the waist down a lot. Again, it doesn't really matter how skinny the character is because you're not going to see it. So I recommend going ultra skinny. And now when we go out of edit mode, we can see that that saved that little uh, penetration there. And that's looking pretty good. So remember, the automatic weight painting works pretty well. And you want the legs to also affect the long clothing, not just the spine. So when the character does bend, it looks like the legs are actually deforming the clothing a little bit. And go into weight painting if you do need to tweak those weights a little bit and make sure that the legs are actually affecting the long clothing as well. Okay, that was it for the weight painting and the longer clothing. Now we're going to go into the uh, Now we're going to go into animating the character, which is always exciting. You can keyframe animate right inside here at Blender and create your custom uh, animations. There are places like Mixamo and things where you can download finished animations. I prefer to make my own animations most of the time because then I can make them really suit the characters. So I'm going to go into the animation tab here at the top. I'm going to put on screencast key so you can see what I'm doing in here. And then I'm going to go to the drop down and change the view here so we can see the texture. And I'll just enable the texture view there. And I'll do the same on the left side here. This is just a separate view without the armature. So we can see our little character here as well. Down here we have a, a timeline that slides currently from frame 1 to 250. And you can see the end frame here is set to 250. And this is where we're going to be seeing our keyframes. I'm going to go to this little drop down and change to action editor. And this is where we'll create most of our actions. And here I can create a new action. So click on this to create a new action. And then we can click on this text field and enter. And I like to start by creating an animation called underscore T pose because when you export animations to Unity, for example, it often picks the alphabetically top sorted pose as the preview pose. And then I'm going to click on this shield icon, which sets a fake user. And that's to prevent the animation from accidentally being deleted if it's not associated with any object at any point. And we're going to record a keyframe now for our T-Pose. So I'll move the mouse cursor up into the viewport, press A to select everything, all the bones. And then I press I to insert a keyframe and we select the location and rotation keyframe. And now down in the timeline, we can see all the keyframes for all the bones here in the action editor. We only need one keyframe on keyframe number one here. Even if it's got 250 as the end frame, it doesn't matter. We just need a single keyframe as a single pose here. That's all we need to do for the T-Pose animation or the T-Pose pose. And now we're going to click on the button here to create a new action. And this one we're going to rename to idle. And then again, we have to click the fake user shield icon to prevent it from being accidentally removed if you do any changes to your objects. And now it's very important to click the record button at the bottom of your screen. Any changes that we make now onto the bones itself in terms of rotation and position are going to be recorded wherever the head is on the timeline. So if I do something on frame 28 here, it would insert a keyframe here. You can go to the start of the timeline by pressing shift left arrow that goes back to the first frame and since we copied the idle animation all the keyframes are already going to be on frame number one i switch off specular lighting in the viewport so i can see the character a little bit better and then i start to rotate and position the bones where i want them it's important to be on frame one in this case i lower the arms by rotating them down i lower the pelvis and that's going to automatically bend the legs as we've got inverse kinematics and then I rotate the feet into position and I move the right foot back a little bit and the left foot forward. Try to find a relaxed pose by lowering the center of gravity a little bit, bending the legs somewhat and then bending the arms in a relaxed position. Maybe you can find your own way to do your own idle animation and you could always look at references. I often find that a lot of games exaggerate the idle position quite a lot. It's quite funny to see how heavy they breathe sometimes. Then I'm going to skip forward now to frame 20 by just dragging on the timeline. And now I'm going to do that little breathe in motion. So I raise the character up a little bit and then I bring the collarbones up or the shoulder bones and I have to compensate the way the arms are rotated as well. I also tend to rotate the shoulders back a little bit. So imagine yourself inhaling a big fresh breath of air. Then you can scrub the timeline by holding in the left mouse button and dragging on the timeline at the bottom 
and you can see how the animation performs. When we're happy with this, it's only recorded the keyframes that are actually changed, and that's okay. Now I mark the top summary keyframe of frame one, and I press Shift D to duplicate it, and that will duplicate all the bones keyframes. And then I drag them to frame 40. And now we should have a cycling animation here that loops a nice idle animation. I changed the end frame to frame 39, and the reason why I don't put frame 40 is because we don't want to duplicate the, that very keyframe. We want it to cycle just before this. So I'm putting the last keyframe on 40, but the keyframe 40 is identical to keyframe 1, and that's why we loop it on 39, so the next frame will be number 1 again. And now we've got ourselves a nice idle animation with breathing, <laughs> heavy breathing. Breathe in, breathe out. So remember, just raise the character up, pull the shoulders up and pull the shoulders back a little bit and then back down into the relaxed pose. For looping animations, I also recommend that you mark all the keys down in the action editor and press Shift E and go make cyclic F modifier in bracket. This one will actually set the animation to be cyclic. So if you play the animation even past the end keyframe, it's still gonna repeat the same animation over and over again. This could be useful when you animate inside of Blender, but it's also useful because when you animate the characters, the trajectory curves of the animations will actually match up better if they're on cyclic. If I press Control tab to go into the graph editor, then we can zoom in this view by holding down the control key and holding down the middle mouse button and dragging the mouse up and down. That can zoom in and out of this graph editor. And the graph editor will show you the animations and how they actually interpolate and bend between the different key poses, because they're not linear by default. They actually follow an east curve motion. So when you loop the animation, you want to make sure that it's actually continuing on the curve. So the way it finishes off, you want to have it so it's set that the next keyframe that's beyond the view is actually going to be merging nicely into the first keyframe on keyframe one. You don't really need to understand all the details here, but make a habit if you're making a cyclic animation like a walk animation or an idle animation to mark all the keyframes and press shift E and go make cyclic. You can switch away from the graph editor by clicking control tab again. Now we're going to make the final animation, which is a walk animation. So I click to create a new animation. I name this one walk. And just to show you here, on the drop down, we can see that there's no F prefix here. And that's because we haven't clicked the fake user. So we click the fake user to protect it from being accidentally removed later on. I nearly always forget the keyframes that I need. So usually I do a Google image search for walk cycle and there's plenty to choose from there. And for this animation, I'm just going to go for this one. And there are the four first keyframes in this that we're really going to be interested in. You can pick a cycle that you prefer and try different ones different times. And uh, this one, I'm going to go for this one that's in this little section here. And I'm going to be looking at the first four frames because the animation there on that particular image actually repeats itself and shows the other legs. So this one, the first four frames that we're going to focus on is the contact frame, the recoil frame, the passing frame, and the high pose frame. And I go to side view with three on the numpad, and then I go to the first keyframe of the walk animation, and I select the pelvis bone, and I press shift space G to make sure I've got the gizmo, and I move the pelvis down. Then I move the leg that's closest to me backwards by sliding the control bone of the IK target bone there towards the back. And then I select for the left leg, I pick the control bone for the IK, and I move that forward, and I rotate it up. So this is going to be the first keyframe of our walk cycle. And then I select all the bones, and while I'm hovering above the bones in the viewport, I press I and I insert a location and rotation keyframe. And then I skip forward, I skip the second frame, and I go straight to number three, so the animation won't be too fast. And for this frame, we're going to look at the second frame in the animation reference. So I'm going to lower the pelvis bone down, and then I'm going to use the foot that's closest to me, the right foot, and move that back and rotate a little bit down. And I do the front foot and flip it down so it lands on the floor and then comes back. And you can scrub a little bit between these frames and see how it performs. And then for frame five, remember we skip number four so it doesn't go too fast. I raise the pelvis bone up and then I pick the foot that's closest to me. I move it forward. This is the passing frame. And then for the front foot, I'm going to try just slide it back by moving that uh, target IK bone back a little bit. And then I'm going to skip forward one frame and uh, land on number seven and we go to the high pose. So I raise the pelvis bone up, and then I continue the motion by sliding 
the furthest away leg, the left leg, back. And then I'm going to do uh, lift the foot on my right leg, the one that's closest to the camera, and then just tilt the foot a little bit as he's ready to be planting that down. And those are the four keyframes that we're going to be using for this uh, walk cycle. Those are the only ones that are important. Now I press A to select all the bones while I'm over the viewport. And then down in the action editor now, I press Control C, and then I skip to frame 9, and I press Control shift v Very important to have the Shift key there. And here's the magic. When you press Control shift v it pastes the same animation, but mirrored. So it's actually going to create that walk cycle automatically for you. We do need to repeat the first keyframe, so make sure you select the first summary keyframe and press Shift D to duplicate it and put it on frame number 17. And then we change the end frame to number 16. Remember, we don't want to go all the way to 17, so it repeats that keyframe twice. And then we're going to have a looping walk cycle. And you probably have to do some tweaking to see if it doesn't work exactly the way you want. You can always tweak the way the legs move a little bit and have it perform a little bit closer to the walk cycle animation that you saw on the keyframe sheet. Now we also need to do something with the arms. And to do that, I go to the front view and I rotate both arms down on keyframe one. That's the first step. And then I go number three on the numpad so we get the side view. And the arm that's closest to me, we want to do the opposite of what the leg is doing. So I'm going to move that forward by rotating it and rotating the underarm a little forward too. And on the left arm, I'm going to rotate the upper arm back and I'm going to rotate the lower arm on the left side down. Then we mark the arm bones alone, press Control C, skip forward to frame number nine and do Control Shift V. That's going to paste it mirrored. Then I go to frame 17 and I press Control V again to repeat the first arm positions. And if it doesn't work for you, if you start to get some funny behavior, it's because you've missed to align the bones along the view axis. So go back to when we created the armature and make sure that you did that step where you press Shift N and align the bones with the view axis from the frontal view of the character. And remember now, this is a looping animation, so I mark all the keyframes, do Shift D, and I make it cyclic. And if I press Control Tab, we can see all the curves here in the graph editor that uh, they seem to be repeating really nicely. And we should have a really nice smooth motion when this animation loops. Looks pretty complicated, right? It's a lucky thing, it does most of this automatically, so you don't have to do so much of it yourself. You just need to put the keyframes, and Blender will automatically blend and animate and interpolate between all of these by itself. Sweet. And then we can just do Control tab again to get out of the graph view. We just needed to show a little bit what it looked like. We don't need to do any changes at all in here. As I inspected the walk animation, I thought it behaved a little bit funny. It had a little bit of a, a strange foot movement that I wasn't quite happy with. And this is quite common for me, so I just scrub through the different animations and see if it's got some sort of a motion that doesn't seem too natural. It's maybe a little bit difficult to get it right the first time. So you can compare it to the walk cycle keyframes that you found on image reference. And then you can do some tweaks to your animation and just keep scrubbing back and forth to make sure that the feet move the way you think they should. And in the end, I was quite happy with the result and I had a, a walk cycle that I was uh, quite happy with. And it's a little bouncy character, perfect for low poly, rapid, and it should be fun. And for an exercise now, you should be able to just Google a run animation cycle and then uh, try to create a run animation. And to do that, remember, you create a new copy of an animation. You could copy this walk animation, delete all the keyframes, and then just repeat the process and try to do it so that you create yourself a run cycle instead of the walk cycle as well. So that's your own little assignment now if you want to give it a go. Exactly the same process applies as we did for the walk cycle. So you could follow those steps, but just use a different reference image and add yourself a run cycle. Good luck. And here comes a really fun part of the process. Now we can clone this character into many others. So select the character, press Shift D to duplicate it, select it in the outliner and press F2 to rename it to template. And now tab into edit mode, press 3 to go into face select, select the top face there, press Control plus on the numpad to expand the selection, and we're going to delete those faces. And now we're going to repair the head by going into edge select mode with 2, pressing E to extrude, and then at the top we just press F to cap the top there, and we've repaired the head. So it's pretty good to have a template that doesn't have a built-in cap or anything. We should have a pretty neutral, simple character there. And now we're going to duplicate this one again. I'm going to rename it to underscore template so it gets at the top a little bit easier to see. 
And now we're going to create our first cloned character here. So I press Shift D on the template and I hide the template with a little eye icon in the outliner. And then we're going to create our first female character now. So it's going to be pretty much a clone of this one to begin with, but we're going to make it a little bit more feminine. So first I'll press F2 to rename it. We'll name her Eve. And then I press Tab into edit mode. And then we just have to go back to what we did before, really, and refine this character. So what should we do? We'll press Control R to create a loop cut around the waist, and then press S to scale it down. And then I press Control R for another loop cut and scale that down. I press 2 to go into edge select, and then I just move these uh, around a little bit. So I move the chest area out a little bit to make it uh, more female-like. <laughs> and then we're going to make the legs skinnier here, so I'll press Control R to add loop cuts and maybe we'll put some short pants or something and then I'll just scale down the edges around the leg there so remember if you practice this a lot you can just get the keystrokes down and the keyboard shortcuts and you'll get the hang of this in no time and remember also we learned earlier in this video rewind if you need to how to colorize the characters so we select faces and on the left side we press G to move the UVs into the area of the colors that we want so now we've got uh, a pair of uh, shorts apparently <laughs> but we'll go up to the neck area and see what we can do here usually i just keep twisting the viewport and i look a little bit from this different angles and i press ctrl r around the neck here and we should uh, change this to skin color or a skin tone so i just make sure we did uh, what just what we did before how to treat the uvs there and then we press g to move the vertices a little bump down on the chest area and Keep in mind now, just keep the middle mouse button pressed down every now and then. Do a little slight rotations so you can see the different angles and see where it looks decent and where it doesn't. And then just keep tweaking it. You could look at reference images at the same time if you've got a separate monitor or on your phone or something. Maybe you can get some ideas from just Google some random images there. And here I spot that we actually got the wrong color in the crotch area there. So I uh, recolor that to be the same as the pants there. Now I'm going to extrude a skirt. So we did that earlier as well when we showed the weight painting there on how it worked with the longer. So it's exactly the same process, uh, just around the waist area there. I extruded it downwards and we've got a little skirt. I changed the colors and uh, I keep repeating myself, but this is very important. Use the middle mouse button to tweak your rotation all the time and then just see that it looks all right from all angles. And then I select all the faces and then I just move the red ones and move them onto pink. And then for the pants there that were brown, or the underwear in this case, I guess, then uh, I move them onto a light blue. And then I select the feet here, the feet faces, and change those to a purple. And there's nothing new here, but it might feel a bit awkward in the beginning. But if you look at the beginning of this video again and again, then you'll get the hang of it. I'm pretty sure that with some practice, and if you start cloning this character now, you're going to be an expert in no time. So give it some time and uh, keep uh, practicing and you'll get there. I do control R for loop cuts on the arms and then uh, I shrink them as well. I keep tweaking the waist and uh, this is my process all the time. I just rotate, rotate, rotate and I just look from different angles and do little tiny tweaks and I keep toggling between one, two, three and one is the vertex mode, two is the edge mode and three is the face mode. And then usually for the female characters, I change the face a little bit to make the cheekbones a little bit higher and the face a little bit more narrow. That's just down to personal preference, how you, however you want to do it. And usually when I clone characters, I just keep doing them a little bit different. I twist the eyes a little bit back and forth and do it. And for this one, we're going to put hair on it. So I select a bunch of faces by holding the shift key and then I do alt E and I extrude faces along the normals. And after I do this, I've got a set of hair that I can use and I change the UV colors by on the left side, you have the faces selected already. Press G to move the UVs into the correct place. And then I can extrude the hair downwards. And we just use all the different keys that we've learned already before. We, be, we press G to move them, S to scale them, and we press E to extrude. We toggle between the different selection mode between one, two, three, which is vertex, edge, and face and keep refining it, looking from different angles. Use the middle mouse button to rotate around the character. Make sure you doesn't have any super dodgy things, and then just try to position it to whatever, either a reference or if you have something in mind, or just play around with it. Use R to rotate, and use S to scale, G to move, E to extrude, and 
The beautiful thing now is that if I press play, it's pretty good weight painted already because a lot of the stuff just came along with the weights that we had because when we extrude something, it copies those from the previous weights that it had. So the hair just follows along pretty good. We have some issues here that the underwear is poking through the hip there, so that needs fixing. And we probably want to change the hair the way it moves a little bit to follow maybe the other part of the body. The first thing to fix is uh, the underwear area here that's poking through the clothing. So we tab into edit mode, do Alt Z to get the x-ray going and press 1 to get the vertex select and just move those vertices in. And then I switch to edge select and I scale them and it just move them in. Again, you're not going to see this very much at all, if at all. <laughs> so you can just scale it down, move it in and just make sure that it doesn't come through. And it's always good to have a little animation that you can test with. You can have different animations. For the hair, it, I think it's too static. So when you rotate the head, it just copied the weight paints from the head cheekbones before that we extruded from. First, I'll add a little bit extra hair. So I go back into edit mode of the character and I extrude a little bit of extra hair. And then we can see now when I rotate the head, it's not so nice. It just uh, moves the hair into the body. So we need to fix that a little bit. That's why I tend to do more male characters than female. It's a little bit faster to do the male characters if they have shorter hair. But we'll go into weight painting mode. So I'll select the armature, shift select the character, go control tab and go into weight painting mode. And then when I have the upper spine selected and then I have the head selected, I can see how the weight paints are affecting and the spine isn't affecting at all now. So in order to fix this, we need to add a little bit of uh, weight paint on the hair for the spine bones because now it's 100% head. So I shift click the upper spine bone and then we're going to try to fix this hair a little bit now. So we see what the weight is at 0 0.338 here. And then I can try to paint and it's difficult because uh, now I, you've got a lot of vertices there. So we can fix this by going back into edit mode of the character. And then I just select a whole bunch of faces that I don't want to edit. So the whole body basically. I use the control numpad plus key. And then I press H to hide it. And then we go back into weight painting mode and now suddenly we can work without having too much risk to damage anything else. And with the top spine bone or spine bone 2 selected, I can add the weight paint and let's increase the weight a little bit and then paint the hair. And since we're in an animation already, we can see that the hair is moving out. And I select the head bone and I reduce some of the weight on that one by lowering the weight. And then with the head bone selected, I paint the tip of the hair there. And you can see that it's reducing the weight on the, how much the head is affecting it. So it's a balance there to find between the different bones. So the balance in this case is between the head bone and the spine two bone to see how much should the head affect and how much should the spine affect in this case. And again, this is a trial and error a little bit and see whatever works for you. Pretty sure you'll come to a situation at some point that you're pretty happy that it's going to be good enough. And Remember that, that's a keyword. Make it just good enough. It's not going to be perfect. There's always going to be issues with it. We're working with low poly now. We're working with very limited uh, ability to make sure that stuff doesn't penetrate all the way through. And we don't have any extra bones for the hair now because we want to save time and make a lot of characters in a short period of time. So just make it good enough. And you're not going to, in quick animations like we have on these low poly characters, you're not really going to notice too much if it goes through a little bit. I also changed the weight paint at the tip of the hair, so that also follows spine to bone a little bit, so it doesn't look so static. And uh, after some tweaking here in the weight painting mode, we just uh, go back into edit mode and unhide the, everything so we can see the whole character again. It's pretty good to go now. I'm happy with the, the way the hair gets affected now a little bit by the spine bone there as well. So I think it's good enough. So in a matter of minutes now, we've uh, got ourselves a female. Right. Upon closer inspection, we've got some uh, penetration issues here on the legs again. So let's just quickly fix that one. Never too late to repeat and uh, solidify your knowledge a little bit. So how do we fix that? Do you remember? Well, first of all, we need to probably get rid of the legs a little bit. We'll show the armature with a little eye icon, tab into edit mode of the character, hide the leg by selecting some faces and pressing H because we don't want to paint the legs by mistake. We go into weight paint mode and then shift select the upper bone here and then we just uh, paint about half the weight there on those vertices and then just make sure that the skirt comes out a little bit along with the upper leg bone there and it's automatically mirrored there. We increase the weight a little bit, make sure that it comes through. And again, it's a little bit difficult when you don't see the colors, you see the weight paints instead. 
So you might have to toggle a little bit in and out of the weight painting mode to see what you're actually doing in the end. But after some practice, when you start cloning these characters, you'll get the hang of it. And in this case, I actually select the lower bone as well because it wasn't enough to just do it on the upper bone. So I maximize nearly the paint on the upper bone there. And in this case, I actually select the lower bone now as well. And I add some weight to that. And maybe not sure that that's the best approach, but it works for this character, especially for the walk cycle. At least you might run into some issues later on when you do other animations. You'll have to just see what works for you and depending on what type of animations you've got. But this looks good now. We've got no penetration. That's always good. Or is it? <laughs> I don't know. So that was uh, quick to make a second character. Now we've just got 98 to go. <laughs> I think I spent about 10 hours in total to make 100 characters by looking at some uh, references. And let's make another character. I duplicate the template again. And uh, on this one, I'm going to put a helmet on it. And I'm going for the approach where the helmet is actually the head itself. Instead of creating a separate helmet to save myself some time, don't plan to have the need to take this helmet off or anything like that. So I'm just editing the character's head now as if it was a helmet. So in edit mode, I again, I toggle often between uh, one, two, three, which is vertex select, edge select, and face select. I use a lot of G to move, S to scale, and control R to add loop cuts. And I rotate the viewport a lot with the middle mouse button to see where anything's poking out. I try to move that in do a lot of scaling and G to move. So I'm going to repeat that a lot. And so are you. <laughs> this is why it's so important to learn the hotkeys. Imagine if you had to go on the menu every time now and click on the little gizmos or drop down menus or anything like that. So it's definitely worth learning those hotkeys. Just make sure that you practice them and it will stick in your mind. I'm sure of it because the workflow just becomes natural at the end. You toggle between these like it's breathing or blinking or something. <laughs> So for this character, I'm then going to do uh, some uh, armor. Uh, let's, uh, I haven't, still haven't colored the head, but let's do some sort of a Roman look. I don't know if it's Roman, but I'll do some sort of a semi-skirt thing. Let's uh, modify the shoulders and maybe put some armor on here. So I'll move the shoulders out a little bit, control R around the neck, move the chest area down and refine all the vertices. So you've heard me say this a billion times now, toggle between the different selection modes. Just select all the edges, vertices and faces, and press G to move them around, S to scale them, E to extrude, Control R for loop cuts, and press G and G again to slide verts and edges along the edge. So if you just want to slide them, press G rapidly, and that, that'll work good. Now I'm going to put armor on it. So I'm going to shift select a few faces here. So I've pressed three to get into face select. And then around the chest area, over the shoulders, and then on the back, I select those. I'll do Alt E, extrude along face normals. And on the left side, I press G, and I move those onto a gray color instead. So we've got some sort of a metal armor here. I toggle between the different selection modes, and I extend the arm a little bit further. Again, this is low poly, so we can exaggerate those quite a bit. And then I move around the edges in this case the i don't know what you call this thing it's like a, not a skirt it's not a kilt it's uh, not pants it's not i don't know what it is it's just something that hangs <laughs> a little bit in the front and the back so press Control r for another loop cut and it's a bit tempted to sometimes get into a little bit too high of a low poly situation i tend not to put loop cuts around the vertical axis to add that adds a lot of details so I always try to do my loop cuts around limbs and around waists and around the head instead, instead of going for, for those vertical loop cuts because that, that will cut through all the body. Here I'm going to change as well the top color. I move the UVs onto uh, skin color. So it's going to be a bare, bare topped armored vehicle, I nearly said. It's not a vehicle. <laughs> Let's uh, narrow down the waist a little bit more. And then when you hold the Alt key in edge select mode and click on one of the edges, it actually loop selects it all the way around, makes it easier for you to select uh, around different limbs. And then uh, I use a lot of scaling here just to shape the arms and uh, use Control R to add a few additional loop cuts if you don't have enough geometry to work with to shape it the way you want. And then just use your imagination when you create all those characters. And sometimes I just play around with it. I do skinny legs, big arms. I do big arms, skinny legs, and don't be afraid to exaggerate the proportions quite a bit when you create these uh, cartoony characters. 
For the head, I'm transforming it to the helmet now. I selected the top faces and then you're using Control plus on the numpad. And then I changed the color to gray on the left side with the UVs. I just grabbed all of those from the top of the head and moved them onto the gray area. And for the eye, I press I to inset that face. And then we can just colorize the center face to a black color. And that's just a quick way to get the eyes there. You could also extrude them inwards a little bit, but I didn't feel that that was necessary. I created some additional leather armor by just extruding the top of the forearm as well. And then just within a matter of minutes, we've got ourselves a little armored soldier of some sort or a warrior. I'll extrude the front of the legs for some metal armor here as well. And just use your imagination or look at references to think of uh, different type of uh, characters that you can create now. And for this character, we don't really need to change the weight painting at all because when we've modified and added some geometry, it just inherits those weights from uh, wherever I extruded it from. And for this character, since there's nothing long that's hanging or swinging, then uh, it's pretty good. Uh, all the weights are, are good as they are. You don't really need to remap them. And also when you do a loop cut with the control R, if it's in between two weights, it'll automatically calculate what the best value is in between there. And you don't really have to do anything with it. So if there's a zero effect on the inner vertex that you do, and it goes to one on the outer vertex, if you do a control loop cut there, control R, right in between, it'll get 0 0.5 on the weight. So automatically it'll just blend those. So that's it. We've got ourselves three characters now that are all working with the same armature. And uh, just press on and make 97 more and you're up to 100. You've got eight hours. Go for it. No, only joking. You've got plenty of time. <laughs> just have fun with it. I'll save another copy of this and again my patrons on the tutorial tier and above will have access to this very blend file and its different stages. To finish off this uh, video I'm going to show you how to export and import these into a Unity project and also to upload them to Mixamo to do some testing with the animations. So I'll create a new Unity project there and this is not really a Unity tutorial now. And this is not really a Unity tutorial now. So I won't go through everything in detail here. It's better suited in a different video. I just want to make sure that you can see how it works when you export and import. So I just follow the process to create a new Unity 3D RP Universal Render Pipeline project. And I use Unity 2022.2.10, but the process has looked very much the same in the last few versions of Unity. So it should be very similar to the way you would see it on your version. And now I'll switch back into Blender here from Unity and you have to enable the armature and the meshes that you want to export and you have to select all of them. So make sure that you've got the armature and the three characters in this case selected and you go to File, Export, FBX. And when you've got this uh, export panel here, you need to browse to the location where you want to save them. And I usually save them straight into my Unity project hierarchy because Unity will automatically import them. So I create a folder called Meshes and it's important on the right here that you keep Limit to Selected Objects change apply scalings to FBX units scale, and then you change the forward axis to Y forward, and that will automatically have up to Z up. And then we can name this file, and I'll just uh, remove this part six here. So low poly character FBX, and then click on export FBX. Now, if we go back into Unity, it'll automatically import this one. So in our project folder here, and if I go into the meshes, which is the folder that I created, I can drag this low poly character into the scene now, and that automatically creates our characters in there. It actually brings all three characters in there. I'm going to rename this folder from meshes to low poly character, and then I'm going to create a new material in here. Let's name this one common, because uh, usually I use the same material for nearly everything that uses this texture. Then you have to browse to the palette files that we were using for this project. Remember, we started by downloading that one. So the albedo texture and the emissions texture, I dragged those into the Unity project. And then for the common material there, I dragged the albedo texture to the base map. And then we enable emission and drag the emission texture in and set the color to white there. And then I have to select all three characters, go into the materials under the inspector and then drag the common material onto the material and now the characters all have the correct material. In the hierarchy now I can select uh, Eve and Warrior and I disable those in the inspector and all that's remaining now is a copy of Bob here in our hierarchy and in our scene view so we can see our character that we modeled just before in Blender here represented uh, works really nicely inside of Unity. 
What we will see here though is for Bob that our rotation is wrong. It says negative 90 on the x-axis and, and that's because the axis system in Unity and Blender are different. To fix this I need to click on the low poly character in the project folder, go to the model tab in the right there and click bake axis conversion and hit apply. That will rotate our character into the correct rotation and we can verify everything. It's facing down the blue arrow now which is the z-axis and that's forward in Unity so that's correct. And we see that the rotation is zero for the main object and for Bob itself. So everything is good to go now. If I click on the low poly character again in the project and go to the animations tab, we can see that we have the three animations here. And we've got the T pose, and then we've got another T pose and another T pose. And this is not looking correct. So we're actually going to fix this now. I'll switch back into Blender, and we've got a few T poses here that are incorrect. And these are, have been linked automatically when we did some of the operations. When we duplicated the characters, it copied the T pose. And sometimes maybe you forget the record button and you start ending up with a bunch of these animations. So it's pretty good that this happened. I can actually show you how to get rid of those. Down here to the left, I'm going to split and create another viewport. And we're going to change this one on the drop down. And we're going to select the non linear animation window. Here we've got the three T poses, and it's one for each character here. And these animations we have to get rid of. And it's a bit difficult to know. We haven't really worked in the non-linear animation editor here, and you would have thought you could just right click and remove it, but it doesn't quite work that way. And these are actually linked to the characters. It doesn't have the fake users, and we didn't see that little F prefix there. So on the right here, up in the top outliner, we can see that there are some animations linked to these. And I want to remove these, and you can delete them by right clicking on them and doing delete. But in the search field, you can type animation, and that actually brings up all the animations. And then you can specifically right-click on each of the animations and do clear animation data. And when you do that, they start to disappear from the non-linear animation editor. And we need to do this for all of them that we've created up here. And now when I do the drop-down here, we can see that it says O here for orphans instead of F for fake user. So those ones, next time we restart Unity, these will be actually disappear from in there. And here we have an issue now because we got none of the ones that, that are just named underscore T posts and they're all orphaned. So we need to make sure that we bring back one of those fake users. So I'll pick one of the T posts, dot zero zero one. I click the fake user shield icon and we just rename this one to underscore T posts. I must have accidentally removed that data. So be cautious when you work with this. You want to make sure that you have your animations there or your actions and that it's got an F as the prefix for the fake user. Otherwise, you really risk losing those animations if you clear them from the different objects in the outliner or if you remove them from the stashed positions in the non-linear animation editor. So make a habit to go to the drop-down of the action editor and make sure that the animations that you want and that you need to keep are down there in the list. It has the F prefix. Anything in that drop-down with an O prefix will disappear and get deleted forever if you restart Blender. So anything with an O, next time you restart Blender, it's going to be gone. So make sure to make a habit of going to the action editor, drop down and make sure there is an F prefix for your actions. Otherwise you risk losing them. Even though it's convenient to export actions as they are, I'm going to show you the way I work with the animations now and how I recommend that you export them as well. You select the armature in the outliner. And in the non-linear animation editor, we make sure to remove anything that says stash on it here. And then we're going to select which actions we want to export. So I'm going to go to the action editor and we've got T-Post selected there for the armature. I'm going to click on push down. And when I click push down, it adds it to the armature on the left there in the non-linear animation editor. Then in the action editor, I change to the idle animation or the idle action, and I do push down again. And on the left, we see now that we've got two items for the armature. We've got the idle and the T-pose. I could do the same here by pushing down the walk animation. That would be in the normal workflow to export all of them. But instead of doing this, I want to show you how you can add animations in the future. So I'm going to remove the walk animation again, just select it and press delete. And then we're just going to export the idle and the T pose for now. And I'll show you how you can add. So I go to File, Export, FBX. We browse into the low poly character folder. And then I'm actually going to delete this one first because here's a bit of a quirk. I've found that if you overwrite the FBX files when you export them, you can run into some problems with the animations. So I'm going to go back into Unity first and delete this one. 
you want to make sure that you try to export your character and get it sorted as soon as possible and you don't really have to modify it so much in the future and that's why i'm going to show you how to add new animations later on because you don't really want to overwrite that file in the future now we go to file export fbx and we make sure that selected objects are there the fbx unit scales forward must be y forward and up must be z up and now under bake animation we expand this we untick all actions and you have to have nla strips still enabled now when we go back into unity it will have imported our low poly character again i have to drag it into the scene again and repeat the process that we did before so under model it will have forgotten that we want to bake the axis conversion so i tick that and click apply and we have it flipped now to the side and you might wonder why that happened and that's because I accidentally only exported one of the characters. And by default, if there's one character, it doesn't create a hierarchy. And the rotation will be incorrect since it's on the root object. So if I just drag the character in again, it should be correct. And we can verify that it's facing forward in the blue Z axis. That's correct. And it doesn't have any rotation on any of the axes. So everything's looking good. But we want the other characters as well. We don't just want Bob here. So... That's because I forgot to select the other two characters when we did the export. So I delete it once again. We have to get used to this. <laughs> I also have to remove it from the hierarchy. And we want to do it correctly. So let's sw switch back into Blender again. We have to redo this again. And uh, you're going to notice that this is perfectly normal to have to do this a few times. This time I make sure that I select all the characters. So we have to select the armature. We have to shift select Bob. And we have to select Eve and Warrior. And now with all of those selected, very important to include the armature and all the characters, go to File, Export, FBX. Make sure we've got selected objects and all the changes that we did before, FBX unit scale and forward. And then under Bake Animation, remember, let's double check. NLA strip is ticked, all actions is unticked. And then we export. Now when we switch back into Unity, it will have re-imported it. We've got all the characters this time, including the armature. We drag it in, but again, now we've uh, redone the process, so remember what we have to do. Go to the low poly character under model, tick bake axis conversion, and hit apply, and everything's back to where we wanted it to be. If I look here now, we've got the armature, we've got Bob, Eve, and Warrior, and all the correct rotations. They're facing down the Z axis, the blue axis. Very important to get this right in Unity from the get go. And it's very important to get the axis correct from the beginning. You always want to have your character facing down the blue Z axis, facing forward, because that is Unity's reference to forward. So all the game logic that you create to have a character moving forward, it's gonna expect that you wanna move along down that blue axis and the forward direction for the character. If you just make do and think like, oh, I'll just uh, live with it and have a fake rotation there and maybe it's facing in the X direction, you're going to run into problems further down your project where it doesn't make any sense. So make sure you get it correct from the start. Okay, we're just going to have a look at Bob now. So let's uh, hide the other two characters by disabling them in the inspector. And I'm going to go to the animations tab. And we can see now under animations here that we've got a T pose and idle. And it looks a bit quirky down here in the preview window. And I'm not sure if that's got something to do with the axis conversion. It didn't used to be that way, but in recent versions of Unity, I've seen it. But it's not really been affecting how it works, so I think we'll just have to live with it for now. It, it still works pretty good in the game itself, but the preview is a bit messed up, unfortunately. But what we do need to do in here is that we need to select the poses that loop, and both of these will do that. So make sure that you tick the loop time on both of these. And once you've done that, you have to hit the apply button as well. And this tells Unity that these animations are going to be looped. To preview this, we have to add an animator. So on the root object of the character, I do add component in the inspector and we add an animator. And we have to create an animator controller. So I go right click here in the project and do create animation controller. Let's just name this one animator for now. And I drag the animator component reference. Then we double click on the animator and go in and create a new state. I right click, create new state. Let's just name this one default. And then we're gonna pick the animations and it's a bit off screen there, but I just drop down Make sure that I pick the idle animation to begin with. And everything else should be able to be left the way it is. So let's go back out into the scene view here and press play. And now we should have an animator and it's just uh, showing from the camera angle there, but which is uh, located behind by default. But it's it's got the animation there and it's breathing. Let's fix the camera a little bit. So we'll align that one to the view here. We can do this by going to game object and align to view. And now when we press play, we'll see a little bit better angle on the character and it's standing there and it's breathing. It's, and it's got our idle animation for its default here. 
I'll create a new cube as well, just to put a little pedestal and put our character on something to stand on so you can see how it's anchored to the ground. And then I'll just rotate the light angle as well so it's not hidden like this. We want the light to come from in the front so we can preview it a little bit better. Now we're going to get back to that walk animation. So I'll go back into Blender and you'll be in a situation where you want to add animations in the future a lot. Make sure that you go into the NLA editor and delete those one with the delete key that we had before. In the action editor, we change it to walk and we do the push down again. So now we just have a single walk animation in the NLA editor. Then all we need to do now is we have to select one of the characters is enough and then shift select and make sure the armature is selected as well. Go to file, export, FBX. Everything is as usual, selected objects, FBX unit scale, Y forward and NLA strips needs to be there and all actions unticked. And then we're gonna name this one just walk animation FBX. And this is the workflow that I recommend that you do in the future if you're gonna add animations. Just import them as separate animation files. We still have to go back into the model tab and tick bake axis conversion and hit apply. You're gonna get used to that workflow. And under animation here, we have the walk animation and this is gonna be a looping one. We can preview it down here. Still looks a bit quirky. Don't know why. Fix that unity, please. And then we have to make sure that we tick the loop time. However, that's important. And then we click apply on this one as well. And now we can change the preview of our character and I'll go into the animator and let's just replace this idle animation with the newly imported walk animation. Go back into the game view and press play and now our character is playing the walk animation. And it's gonna be a different tutorial to blend between these, and I'll show you how to do that in a separate Unity tutorial, but this is the gist of it. And I think this workflow works really well. Just make sure that you export the character with maybe just the T-pose and an idle animation in the base FBX files. Every other animation that you do, I recommend that you export them as separate FBX files, because that will not destroy any of the previous work that you've done. You wanna to try to avoid having to re-import the FBX files that contains the meshes. So use separate FBX files for your animations. Use the NLA editor to push down the animations that you want to export. Make sure it's clean like that and export them, import them, and then uh, just keep adding more and more animations. That seems to be a really good workflow. So there we have it. Uh, our characters are working really well. We can uh, switch which one is active. Let's uh, disable Bob. Actually, literally, yeah and enable Eve. So this is what she looks like in there. Works good. That's disable Eve. That sounds so hard, horrible. Sounds harsh. <laughs> and then we'll enable warrior. And all three characters here work really well. And you could theoretically have uh, hundreds of these and you could have separate FBX files, you name it. You could uh, have literally a hundred characters or a thousand, maybe 10,000, who knows. <laughs> Now I'm gonna show you how to go into Mixamo as well. That's gonna be the last step of this very lengthy. It's either a long tutorial or a short course. I'll let you pick. So let's export Bob here for Mixamo. I'll go to File, Export, FBX. And now we just have Bob and the armature selected. I'll create a new folder and let's just call this one for Mixamo to keep it tidy. And then here's important, go to Path Mode and do Copy in the dropdown and then enable this little box here which says embed textures. Otherwise, you'll just have a white character inside of Mixamo. And this way, it's gonna include the texture that we've got for our material. And then the rest can be left pretty much the same as we've done previously. Selected objects, FBX units scale, Y positive forward. And now we've exported our FBX files for Mixamo. So I'm gonna head over to the Mixamo website now and log in. Now we upload the character. I click on upload character and I browse to the file here and uh, we're just gonna have it upload to the website. And here we go, we've got Bob included, and you see now that it's uh, super wrong. He's tiptoeing, and he looks uh, somewhat uncomfortable. And that's because I exported this with the walk animation. So to do it correctly, let's delete the walk animation. Let's set the T-pose. That's the one we wanna use. So we redo the process, make sure he's posed in the T-pose. Make sure Bob and the armature is selected, Let's do the same export, make sure the path mode is copy and the embed textures there. Everything else is just like before. And uh, we try this again. Let's close it, upload character, select the character file, browse to our FBX file, and let's upload this one. And hopefully now we should have a bit of a better pose that looks a little bit less painful. Here we go, it's included the texture and it's playing one of the Mixamo animations. Let's just click next here and try one of the animations. Should we search for maybe a swing dance animation? Let's click on one of them. 
And here we go. Bob is now dancing. I like to speed up with the overdrive here for the low poly characters. It just looks a lot more suitable for the style that we're going for. So that's it. Bob is now dancing swing inside of Mixamo and we've uh, got the characters running in Unity and everything's good to go now. You're all set to create thousands of characters for your games. So thank you for uh, watching this tutorial or like I said, it's either been a very long tutorial or a very short course. So I'll let you decide which one it is. And uh, thank you so much for watching. And if you do like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And a big shout out now to my patrons. I want to thank you from uh, the bottom of my heart. Ooh, that sounded emotional. No, I really want to thank my uh, patrons because you're really helping me out to do these things. And to reward you guys, I'm actually uploading my own characters. So the tutorial tier on my Patreon will get 10 of the characters that I created. The game dev tier on my Patreon will get 30 of the characters. And the hero tier, you guys will get all 100 of these characters. And you can use them royalty free in any game project that you want to make. If you want to make prototypes, if you want to make a free game, or even if you want to make a commercial game and make a fortune on it. You can use these characters if you're a Patreon. As long as you're a Patreon of mine and you've got access to those files, you can use my characters too. But I also encourage everyone to create their own characters. <laughs> so go ahead, everyone. Enjoy it. Have some fun. Let's do some low poly stuff. And uh, yeah, enjoy it.